<laughs> Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to Sunrise Daily Today. I am Chamberlain Uso. Good morning from Abuja. I'm Mark Wilgin Yusuf. Welcome to the program. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I know, forgive me. I felt that way when I walked oh. in. Welcome okay. to the show. I'm Kaya Dioki here this Friday morning. Indeed, it's an easy peasy Friday. Good morning and welcome to the program. I am Bukola Samuel with you. Well, it may look a lot like Christmas if the DSS carry out their threats because they've given marketers 48 hours to assure that fuel supply is addressed in the country. Look, it may sound and look a bit odd that the DSS is giving the marketers, the, the fuel people, if you could group them all in that category, to ensure that fuel supply is in the country. But look, if that is what it's going to take to ensure that there's fuel, fuel supply across parts of the country, what can anybody say? But it's, it's not exactly as straightforward as that, you know, uh, on my ad, because there's several layers of all of these things. And we understand that they had some meetings with some of those uh, marketers or their representatives, as it were, yesterday, the DSS. And perhaps it might have been from there that they came to that conclusion that, look, this has got to be addressed. Because the reasons that the NPC has given over time hasn't, many just don't buy it. Uh, we had several comments, several sessions on this program, trying to find out what exactly is the problem. And it doesn't appear as though it's just one thing. You can't just place your finger and say, this is the main problem. And so now that the DSS has given this one, we'll wait and see because they say, look, after that 48 hours ultimatum ends and they don't do anything, we will be forced to activate their unit. So what that means, so how that is going to play out, uh, we will wait and see because, um, I don't know, they're going to accuse them of what, economic sabotage? They say, look, there's a security threat, a security component to all of these things. And so um, it's important. Even though after that, some of the conversations we had here, uh, some of the marketers say, well, they reached out to a number of them and uh, they've got 10 trucks each, even though they're, they're going to go ahead and load and distribute to some strategic stations, you know, whatever that means. But it will be interesting to see what happens at the end of the day with this one. 48 hours, they say. And the time, wait, I think it's at counting yesterday. Would it be today? I can't wait, actually, to get fuel in the tank. <laughs> You know, today, uh, Trimbley, I think my head is a typical woman's brain this morning. <laughs> it's a real spaghetti. I was reading something online. I was saying something about how men's brains are in compartments and women's brains are, are like spaghettis, you know, or a huge wire ball, something like that, you know, where every wire is touching every wire and everything is connected. Uh, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> on this particular issue and um, and it's not very tidy so it's not easy to say but let me first of all let me see if i can make sense of it for you um dss getting into few distribution matters i never heard of it before but hey what do i know it's very interesting as jimbling highlighted there is now a security component which they think you know could be activated if there is no fuel supply normally in uh in countries where things usually can get volatile, um, the lack of energy supply, uh, as exemplified by the few shortages we have witnessed, witnessed in our country, are the sort of things that can spark protests, mm -hmm. and protests that you do not know how they'll go. Uh, is the sort of things that people can hijack. I, I, I'm not give, trying to give any ideas, but this, we've seen countries go and strike over things like a hike in the price of bread. Uh, you know, or well, price of flour that's used to make bread. Uh, and here we are, for months on end, we have just been, uh, you know, suffering and smiling with this fuel scarcity and finding ways around it to still go about our businesses. We show up at work, uh, we, do, we run businesses like I see if nothing has gone amiss. Um, uh, inflation is hitting the roof and you know, everybody's just trudging on one way or another. Yeah. So I find it interesting at this time around the DSS is the one who is speaking up on this one. They must know something that we don't. Uh, and they're given an ultimatum. They have listened, I guess, to both uh, sides of the divide. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe they know that maybe there is really not much to it. And then they, this can be resolved. And they're giving them 48 hours to resolve this. Now, 
I do not know what this threat is about, but I think that this is a... Was it yesterday with some marketers threatening uh, NNPC? I'm, I'm not sure which who was threatening who, but there was a threat we read in the papers yesterday, and I said, or oh, what will happen? But this one, uh, I wouldn't yeah, date. <laughs> I think I, <laughs> this is one threat that one can take a bit more seriously. But hey, as Jimmy said, it's a wait-and-see game, because honestly and truly speaking, Nigerians are tired of the games. We're, we're really sick and tired of it. Um, you know, for months and then just doing this, worrying your head about how to move your, your car, or how to move from one place to another. It shouldn't be part of our worries. There are enough worries in the world. How to get petrol shouldn't be one of those extra worries. By all means, please. Indeed, Mark, well, really, there, there are some stories you see first time, and even though you know it's definitely from a credible source, it's from your correspondence, you know it's, it's, it's as cred credible as it can get. You want to double check again just to be sure. Did I see DSS? Is it the same DSS? And then you go and check, oh, it's DSS. It's DSS. Oh, are we talking about fuel? Oh, yes, we are. We're not talking about just, you know, core security. And, uh, well, as you said, it's... When you look at, I mean, in generality, it's some sort of good news because at the end of the day, it looks like people will eventually now start getting fuel supply when they drive into the petrol station. So uh, for the end result, indeed, fantastic, bravo. But then how will this work is the big question. Yes, it's the DSS. As Mark West said, nobody jokes with the DSS, honestly. And, you know, listening to the spokesperson saying that they had a meeting with the stakeholders, yes, marketers and other stakeholders. I was just thinking about the just the value chains uh, in, in that sector. And first of all, maybe we can get to a point where we can start uh, to reduce all of the bottlenecks. Because uh, just getting fuel into your car, into your generator is what you want. But if you know what actually the process is, you know, the vessel that brings it onto the high sea, the daughter vessel, how much it costs to just rent that, to bring it then to the depots, who then... By the way, we understand that NMPC does not have enough depots, so they have to take it to private depots. And when you hear that Nigeria has what supply for over 30 days, majority of it is on the high sea, by the way. So it's not really uh, fuel that we have very close to us or we have in the depots. It's still really on the high sea, majority of that. And then you now talk about the petroleum marketers. You know, there's the whole Dapman, Moman, uh, there's the uh, retail owners and all of that. And you just want to just to get petrol into your car, your generator. There's all of that. So it will be interesting to see how the DSS will go through all of that hurdles to ensure that the 48-hour ultimatum stays. That's one for me. And two is, since we're seeing that this, you know, fuel, secure, fuel scarcity, fuel issues can um, harm or, I mean, exacerbate insecurity, what about poverty? Poverty has been said to be one of the major reasons why we're seeing insecurity. Will we be seeing the DSS say, well, we're giving government maybe not 48 hours, seven days, one month ultimatum to bring this, at least to nip it in the bud as, it's, as they say, or even if you can't, reduce it because this is a major issue that causes insecurity. Can we begin to look at those issues and say, maybe we can deploy the DSS more? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying this morning. Does it, does it make sense? <laughs> well, it, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to be a very um, uh, available option, an option that will be available too often, Kaidi, for the DSS to have to intervene. Because how many times have we had fuel scarcity in Nigeria, you know, this year alone? I'm, I'm always, I've lost count of the times Mark complains mm. about the lingering fuel scarcity in Abuja. But, you know, if the DSS has come in this time, there's more to it than meets the eye, but it's security. It's a matter of security. It's a matter of intelligence. We can't uh, compel the DSS all of the time and even on this other security agencies, you know, to open up on the motivations for some of the things that Indeed. they do. But do we, should we demand the same accountability of the NNPC, of the Minister of State for Petroleum, of the Minister of Petroleum? Uh, you know, I think... You and I know the answer to that question. Of course, we should demand the same accountability on wh why the uh, petrol scarcity lingers. You know, months down the line, was it in July or thereabout, the Minister of State for Petroleum was saying that the scarcity would linger until full deregulation of the sector. The question you would now ask is, 
Why then has you know, fuel subsidy been prioritized in the 2023 budget? You know, for crying out loud, uh, shouldn't you know, social intervention and other options available to making life easy for the people uh, of the country you know, have been at the top of you know, the priority list of government officials? These are some of the questions. Um, in, in the next few months, are we still going to have petrol scarcity? The answer seems to be, you know, many yeses down the line. Um, what price? Can the DSS also regulate the price that the independent marketers, you know, would access the product at the depots? No. no. These are some of the issues. Can the DSS intervene, you know, at NNPC petrol stations where Nigerians have to access the product for private use and they're not being sold? By the way, that's one of the questions. If any petrol station should, uh, you know, place a ban or, uh, you know, say that Nigerians cannot buy petrol in jerry cans, it shouldn't be the NNPC. But that's what you find in most filling stations, uh, most NNPC filling stations in Lagos. Mm. These are some of the questions. You know, the DSS can intervene where security is concerned. But on other critical issues, as far as petrol supply is concerned in the country, I doubt that the DSS, and those are the more critical points this morning. Chimbele, Malkwe. Well, you know, the, the thing is, I'm, I'm sure DSS, they know what to do and their limits and what is necessary. So if they've told them, hey, ensure the supply is out there, uh, well, well, wait until the 48 hours and they will activate something. It doesn't mean they will begin to perform the roles of DAPMA. <laughs> for all the other agencies. They just tell, they know the strategic points. And so when that happens, we'll see. So in the meantime, what can anybody do? Uh, it's a matter of fact, the dailies are highlighting that a lot more this morning. Look at New Telegraph, which we'll start off with here today. DSS orders Ipman, Moman, others to end fuel scarcity in 48 hours. Who doesn't like to hear that? So, uh, well, maybe the, the people who are trying to sabotage your profiteer may be angry, but hey, everybody's got to get this product moving on. Plans nationwide enforcement. So there you go. Maybe that might answer your question. Vows to deal with threats to national security, public safety. Stakeholders pledge product availability. So there you go. It's coming through from stakeholders now. So. Um, I don't think they'll be giving the DSS sound bites as well because they could they'll know the implications of that. So um way to go. One reckons. And then cash withdrawal limits, reps other CBN to hold policy. Someone in Mayfield. I know that yes, there's a lot of talk across the country concerning uh, how this is going to play out. But the CBN, okay, look at the writers. As banks take custody of new notes, we won't be rigid on cashless policy execution, CBN governor, as Apex Bank receives over 500 billion naira old notes, Bari's support. So I think he says, look, when it's got to, perhaps he was referring to the withdrawal limit. Yes, maybe they could, they won't be rigid concerning that, but of course the policy, he says, yeah, they will stick to those policies. They will do what they have to do to ensure that uh, the policies, the overall objective, which we we'll like to believe is well intended will be achieved but the allowance he says yeah we will not be rigid but as supposed to well i don't know if the house has the, i don't think it's a final decision as of yet because the speaker did say they will have a word with the senate on this matter so hoping that no they're saying give don't be rigid about it doesn't mean stop it entirely please not well, we'll see how that conversation goes. Daily Trust has the same story uh, couched in a little, slightly different manner. Mm -hmm. DSS gives NNPC marketers 48 hours to end fuel scarcity. Uh, that's the lead story for them. Vows to deal with economic saboteurs. NNPC has 1.9 billion liters in stock. I don't know. <laughs> Who's stock? Every time I see this, I, I'm so annoyed. I don't know. Just... So why they're not what do I want to do with there? the figure if I cannot access it easily that makes what? sense exactly 1.9 they've been saying this oh we have 2 billion liters oh we have 3 months worth of supply and storage can you just distribute it efficiently too you know that's all we're asking mm -hmm. markets is to get product at X depot price that's a page 4 read um, 
They have all of the details for you on page four of the paper. I guess you might be interested in it this morning. Look at this, questions over enforcement as VIPs escape, in parenthesis there, contempt convictions. So IGP was uh, um, oh, okay. asked to be jailed. I mean, the court said the IGP should be jailed over contempt, uh, jail the EFCC boss over contempt, jail the chief of army staff over, but everybody escaped it. So. They're raising questions for you on the front page of Daily Trust this morning. <laughs> Boko Haram demands bicycles, condiment others from farmers. Uh, that story is still on. Condiment. Yes, condiments. We don't even need money now. Just give us bicycles and condiments for food. Um, page five read for wow. you. Wow, so this chap should do Christmas. Huh? Hmm? Okay. Oh, so there's wow. this other story now making the rounds. I don't know whether you, uh, anyone has taken has seen it. Sirica under fire over boast about funds to prosecute election. Um, it's on page 12. What? I haven't seen the story, but if you're interested That's in it. That's news actually. Yeah, page 12 will give you details. Funds to prosecute election and we still have on this Nigeria air. <laughs> it's still flying in the air somewhere. No funds to prosecute that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, page 12. Oh, maybe, you know, maybe the matter has been stalled because I understand that some of the stakeholders are in court uh, right now. But look at this. Uh, 11 foreign firms beat for a Jaukota Steel Company. We're still on this matter, seven years on. It's on page 7. Maybe that's how they put it there. Page, <laughs> on page 7 for you. Hmm. Um, and after, Nigeria targets 12 billion dollars trade, 10% of Africa's global imports. Mm. So page 25 is where you get details. I, I got some insights recently mm. uh, as to the fact that Nigeria delayed on signing um, delayed on signing the AFTA because goods that were produced in the export zone, and, uh, and we have quite a number of export zones, uh, were not included for Nigeria as, as re recognized as goods made in Nigeria. Uh, they were going to be treating them as, um, let's say, external imports. So I think Nigeria delayed signing on that after bill because they wanted their own clause, their own parts of the agreement to include goods manufactured in our export zones. Hmm. Mm, so, Point of origin controversy. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, leave it there for Daily Trust news papers this morning. Well, it is bold on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct. It's another angle, and this one will interest you. Still on the field scarcity, you see, following DSS 48-hour ultimatum, NNPC releases 1.9 billion liters PMS. Assures of collaboration with stakeholders for adequate supply during election. What? That was a very fast transfer from the high sea to the depot or to the petrol stations. I don't understand how that happened because, <laughs> I mean, what we know is that the majority of it is still in the vessels. So I don't know. Was, is it a release or is it just really there? Yes, maybe beyond our reach to an extent, but it's still there. So I don't know about this one, but that's what you have there. Um, but election is still in February. We need to feel today, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, really. But you know, it's a page three read. Um, again, if you don't want to joke with the DSS, so way to go, we'll see how that plays out. And uh, just on top of that, uh, at the top corner of the paper, you see 100,000 Naira cash limit. Political forces blow against CBN as reps order policy suspension. It's interesting how this is couched yet again, political forces. Uh, so clearly the last has not been heard. In fact, I understand that the CBN governor is meant to uh, brief the National Assembly at some point next week. So uh, uh, all eyes on that one, see how it goes. And um, just to give you another angle to this story, Senate President Lamin's neglect of livestock sector calls for government support. Now, this story has been couched, reported, and even interpreted in another light. So, uh, well, that's how the news directs couches it, uh, asks for government support for the livestock sector. So that's also on the inside pages of the Niger News Direct. I'll leave it there for the paper. Mm. And it's another compelling caption from the front page of This Nigeria this morning. Well, it's as far as the new cashless policy is concerned. Let's see how it is rendered. New cash policy. Reps order CBN to halt exercise. And the riders go this way. I have Buhari's backing. Emifiele responds. Promises not to be rigid on limit. 
Apex Bank mops 500 billion Naira old notes into the vaults. Well, that's a good one. But then again, uh, I can't, you know, immediately erase the images of those, you know, rotten Naira notes found in trucks and inside buildings and, you know, loaded into bags of, uh, you know, bags that are that used to contain, to carry rice. And those Naira notes just went rotten uh, following the announcement of the policy. But hey, CBN has been able to mop up out of all of that amount in circulation, 500 billion Naira notes into the vault. So way to go. Uh, let's see some more stories on the front page. Go. This one is uh, at the bottom strip. Military under pressure to compromise 2023 elections that's attributed to Irabo CDS but will remain neutral uh, that's a page five read and again intelligence there you know being released who's pressuring the military to compromise the 2023 elections why for what reason find out inside page five and uh, above the nameplate you find this one certainly the last has not, has not been heard about the continuing uh, rift between the G5 governors and the leadership of the People's Democratic Party. And this is a recent development. Rivers alleges plot to blackmail Wike over G5 demands. Uh, that's a page eight read. And you know, just to provide a bit of insight, the State Commissioner for Information is talking about a document that's uh, uh, titled hashtag end Wike rascality. You know, so of course, we'll be hearing a lot about that in the coming days. And uh, lastly, just before we exit this Nigeria, AFDB releases $8.9 billion for low-income African countries. you find that inside page 15. Another, you know, worthy development. But then again, this is not the first of AFDB's intervention, uh, particularly since COVID and following the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, just to help um, the prices of food and other agricultural products in African countries. But how has it significantly helped, you know, to bring down the prices of food, particularly if Nigeria has been accessing some of these funds, you know, from the AFDB? But then again, uh, let's leave it there for this Nigeria this morning. On to Leadership Friday today, 78 days to go, military will resist pressure to scuttle 2023 elections, says DHQ. And look at the riders, saboteurs, bad eggs to face firing squad. Well, uh, will there be a, is that literal or that's figurative? Yeah, well, that's what's playing in my head now because I imagine it's figurative because I mean we're still a country that follows laws and and there's no there's no such thing in our laws. Because I don't see the parenthesis here, uh, that, so that's why I'm not. Who, 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 who. And I don't think it's in the military laws either. They still have to go through due process. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. I mean that's not to say we're encouraging support was We're just. Yeah, but uh, that's why you need to read the story yeah. and see what context this is taken from. Uh, Atiku urges politicians to focus on voters, not pressure military. Army refutes report of troops aborting pregnancies in Northeast. Now this pressure to security agencies will come in different forms. Now the military has spoken up. So the police, Nigeria police, must resist that temptation to aid or abet or help any politician do anything whatsoever against any other political party. Uh, they must be seen, they must arrest and do things objectively as it is. And then, oh yeah, let's not forget the DSS too. They've got a huge role to play in all of this as well. They too must be above board. So all security agencies, Nigerians have got their eyes on you. So to be sure that um, things go well, because even INEC, INEC staff, members of staff too, must be sure that uh, resist the pressure wherever it may come from, because the president has said this election must be credible. So we'll, we'll uh, hinge our hopes on that. And speaking about the president, look at this. PMB will leave Nigeria better than he met it. Gambari, you should read it and see, perhaps in the area of the power sector, you never know. 
uh, roads, yeah, at least travelers, but uh, what? Uh, the bridge going to the east, yes, they can move for a while now. So, quite a number of things. But we must also, those scenarios playing out in rivers about attacking politicians, security agencies have got to move in real quick on that because you don't want that to fester. Mm -hmm. Brevity. Mm -hmm. Spontaneity. Mm -hmm. You have to move real quick mm -hmm. and ensure that whosoever mm -hmm. is involved in that, they have to answer questions. You don't want any such thing as reprisals or revenge. We don't know where that will stop, so that should end. So, NSA, I hope that he's taking note of that and, you know, calling the security agencies that need to be acting. They should be seen uh, to be doing something yes, after the ultimatum. Immediately. Uh, look at what The Guardian has on the front page for you. Uh, so, focusing on security. We won't compromise 2023 despite pressure, says Irabo. That's okay. the lead story here. Okay. Uh, PDP, shun all entreaties and temptations to thwart peaceful polls. Stakeholders want synergy among INEC, NCC, Nige Comsat for hitch free election. 2023 polls significance to Africa's stability, West African leaders say. So even uh, the West African region is very interested in what is happening in our country, and rightfully so. Uh, page six is where you'll find details. Uh, they also have this military NGOs and the challenges of winning peace against the insurgency. It's a big story for you on the front page. Uh, Vice President Oshibaju has been away in Vietnam and uh, he, yeah, the story here says Oshibaju meets Vietnam's President Harps on why Nigeria is best place to invest in Africa. Don't buy meter transformer wires. NERC tells electricity consumers. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've been buying it since now. Uh, what is all this? Jim, uh, what, what was that? Was that We've been buying these things. So what have they been doing about it now? <laughs> yes, I think... In your area, if you don't buy trust me, if you like, don't buy it, you will stay in darkness for years. For the people who don't buy, or for the people who are bought, what have you done? What about the people? Do I ask them how many years they were in darkness for? <laughs> It's Anyways, uh, page three, if you're interested in that story, oh. <laughs> is where you will find details. Uh, I wouldn't leave a tickle. I'd like my to be proved wrong anyways. Yeah, Should I mean. Should have press release. Well, maybe they're doing something about it. Just maybe, maybe. I won't leave a tickle, my by insists, as hoodlums attack house, destroy cars, others. This is really sad to see yeah. happening in Rivers because... Um, this uh, Senator Mayaba is also a member of the PDP, so questions as to where is that coming from. DSS gives an NPC, Ipman, Nupeng, others 48 hours. You already saw that to end fuel scarcity. Um, it's on their page two. But um, there was a story I saw here I wanted to highlight. Yeah, well, it's, we're still here. Uh, despite reps intervention, Emir Philly says no going back on cashless <laughs> policy, withdrawal limits. There's I no know, going back but, but I thought he said they won't be rigid. For the CBN in, in, at some point. he just knows that one with the president <laughs> is majority. The House members can, <laughs> can you know, muster their numbers all uh, they want. Yeah. All the 300 and how many of them now? 360 of them. Because if I next say, look, we're not the one to, uh, what, arrest, vote bias, I say, well, okay, we'll start from somewhere. We'll look at where, where is that, where are those funds to buy votes coming from? We'll track and see what happens. So maybe this might just be a way, just maybe, you never know. Anyway, page six is where you find, let's leave it there for the Guardian newspapers. And from there, let's uh, turn our attention to the Nigerian Tribune. And I'm interested in the Nigerian Tribune this morning for good reason. We'll get there in a moment, but let's begin with the big story. CBN, we won't be rigid on cash withdrawal limit, but policy stays. So uh, the House of Representatives has had better relax on its request or its order that uh, the cash withdrawal policy be uh, suspended. Uh, what will the new withdrawal limit be? Well, we're expectant and waiting for the CBN governor uh, to make uh, appropriate announcements in that regard. But take a look at the rider. Here's how he was able to, uh, you know, make boast of how the policy st stays. Meets Buhari in Daura gets his support. That's the CBN governor. Says 1.4 million super agents exist. Uh, 500 billion naira old notes now in bank vault. And lastly, 
begins distribution of new Naira notes. Reps order CBN to halt policy. Uh, the story you'll find inside uh, the Nigerian Tribune, specifically on pages 7 and 8. Uh, let's go a bit further down to look at some stories at the bottom strip. Suspected political thugs attack Atiku's man in rivers. Of course, uh, Chamberlain and Mark already highlighted that uh, against the attack, a reported attack on Honorable Lee Maiba. House invaded vehicles damaged. Rivers government says group orchestrating campaign of calumny against Wiki over G5 demands. Yes, uh, more insight now from uh, the story earlier highlighted from this Nigeria over a document titled um, hashtag end wiki's rascality you find this on page three of course uh, there's a need for you to read this so that you get better insight but here's this one that's a bit of good news particularly for the electorate 5.6 million pvcs collected in lagos that's coming from the electoral umpire and you find it inside page 28 5.6 million is quite a number but the critical thing is uh, for a good number of this figure to come out on election day, on all election days, and exercise their franchise. The PVC as yeah. a, an ID card mm -hmm. for some reason. No, it's beyond that. It's actually for you to vote, exercise your franchise. So it's, it's beyond just an identity card. So right. make that number count. Absolutely. Yeah, in February. All right, uh, let's take a look at this one. A Jalputa plant. FG begins payment of $486 million arbitration fee to litigants. Uh, well, that's an industry that has been murdered in circumstance and Nigeria is losing <laughs> billions, you know, billions, albeit of uh, dollars now, not Naira, you know, to the um, non-functioning, you know, so to speak, yeah. of the Ajakuta Steel Company. That needs to be looked into uh, such that uh, uh, Nigeria can begin to take advantage of that natural resource in huge deposits in the north central part of the country. Uh, let's go above the nameplate now and see this one. Yes, this is where my interest is specifically. Lagos Ibadan Road project will be delivered by March 2023. That's ascribed to the federal government. It was December at first, right? Uh, well, it was, it was within the first quarter of 2023, but certainly not March. What we heard was sometime in February. Oh, I thought but that now, was December uh, at first. It's been shifted yet again to March. To March. So that's some more months of difficulty for travelers on the, the Lagos Ibado <laughs> Expressway. You know what shocks me recently? Hearing that people who ply that route actually have a WhatsApp group where they update on the traffic situation. Yes, we so do. they tell you, oh, well. <laughs> yes, we do. The traffic is starting like 10 kilometers out of Lagos this time. Or so it be, I mean, it's just, it just paints that picture for me. And I just, it's, it's really, it hurts to see that people have to go through that every day. Mm. Now the average uh, travel time on that road for a journey that shouldn't be more than 20 minutes is six hours. Six hours. Yes, six hours a day. So we hope that the federal government is listening and, you know, something ought to be done. Yeah. The earth roads can be more accessible and they are the alternative. The alternative, But right. we're hearing that there's, uh, you know, this thing about whose jurisdiction it is to uh, fix the earth please. roads. Is it the Ogun State government or is it the federal government? Please, I mean, when it's time to share <laughs> share the money. The there's national no, cake. I mean, it, it, it goes to who it needs to go to, but when we need to actually, because you know how much people actually come into Lagos on a daily basis. Some mm -hmm. actually have to work every day. I mean, you're one of them. So uh, why can't yeah. we just resolve all of that? It's Federal become a norm thing. now for security agents to be on the other side of the expressway where traffic is free flowing, you know, to collect bribe from those who are driving against traffic. You yeah. know, where they're needed on the other side, where there is traffic, you find that the security agents are nowhere to be found. Uh, where are, you know, what's, what's, what, what are they called now? Trace, yeah. the traffic management agents in Ogun State. They're nowhere to be found on the Lagos Ipado Expressway, but that's where they're needed the most. Response time when an articulated vehicle tumbles over is, you know, near zero. And then you find travelers suffering on the expressway. And they're attacks too from time to time. Yeah, they're attacks. 
So let's leave it there for the Nigerian Tribune. Well, Daily Times is next uh, this morning. Daily Times leads with the cashless policy story. And you see, no going back on bank withdrawal limits. And I feel it. He met with the president yesterday. I heard Mark West saying, one with the president is in the majority. I imagine the DSS also has, of course, the president is on the same page with this. So, well, there you go. Says CBN to slightly review amounts. So maybe that's another angle to the rigidity he talked about. Uh, HOR summoned to Mifiele wants CBN to suspend policy. Uh, interesting days ahead, clearly. Uh, under the big picture, you see military will resist any pressure to compromise election. General Irabo uh, saw the angle from another daily earlier. So it'll be important to read this story so you get the real meat of it, right? And uh, just one more for you. And this one is on, I mean, it's for businesses. FG to review credit disbursement criteria by development institutions. That's according to the finance minister. In fact, it's beyond businesses for the nation at large. It's a page three read. We'll leave it there for the Daily Times. Chamberlain. Paper petrol DSS orders dealers to restore supply in 48 hours. So whether or not they go 1.9, 2. trillion, whatever trillions of liters, the only way we can all see this is when there are no queues at the station. Point blank. Uh, look at the riders at officially approved rates. Okay, that's uh, worthy of note. That's uh, not 200, not 250. One what? 68. Okay. Defaulters to be treated as threats to national security. Who wants to be treated as such? So be warned. As DSS meets NMPC officials, marketers, tanker drivers, other stakeholders. So it would be good the media will be present there so that we all see what's going on. 2023 polls, we won't succumb to pressure ascribed to DSS. And then when some dailies say no going back on withdrawal limits, look at this here. CBN may tweak new cash withdrawal limits, says MFA. So when they then say no going back, I think context is very important in this. And I think everyone else might just go ahead and see what's, how, what he meant, what he actually did say about that withdrawal limits of, uh, you know, the cash as it were. That ends a look at some of the dailies here this morning. We are back in just a moment. Stay with us. Who are the people stealing oil in Nigeria? Is it the poor man on the street? Who are the people carrying crude oil in Nigeria? The, the, law, is there, the law is not obeyed. During Tuesday's plenary session, Senator Adeyemi gives voice to the question many Nigerians have pondered on. Who are the perpetrators of oil theft in the country and when will they face the law? Nigeria's crude oil production as at January 2020 stood at 2.13 million barrels per day. However, because of insistent pipeline sabotage and theft, the production fell to as low as 1.38 million barrels per day as of July 2022. Mr. President, the, ad hoc committee members had to stop the Senate set up an ad hoc committee to investigate oil theft and the committee chairman presents the report to the upper chamber. He paints a sobering picture of the magnitude of lost revenue because of oil theft. The country has lost over $2 billion to oil thefts between January and August this year alone, which lost revenue ordinarily would have supported the country's fiscal deficit and budget implementation. The committee makes some key observations in the report, most notably that there is a plethora of government entities or representatives present at export terminals with duplication of roles leading to conflicting figures being churned out. Major export facilities, the Boni and Focados terminals, have been shut down for more than seven months because of pipeline vandalism, and this has affected gas supply to Nigeria liquefied natural gas NLNG by 30 to 40%. The country's inability to meet its OPEC quota between January and July 2022 was due to pipeline vandalism and theft. NNPC is not giving freedom to those two committees that were set up, the NUPRC and the one for the downstream. NNPC still sits as a boss for those two agencies. And that is not what the PIA is, PIA is saying. It's stated that in Saudi Arabia, you have this real-time monitoring 
of the entire system. It's not uh, rocket science. Why shouldn't why can't we employ the same technology in this country? After an extensive debate, it further recommends an immediate streamlining of the agencies present at the terminals, and the NUPRC should expedite the deployment and strict enforcement of the Advanced Crude Oil Cargo Declaration Solution to detect and mitigate illegal movement of vessels. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. So yes, we'll be looking at that, plus other issues that concern you as a Nigerian, your well-being. And to do that with us this morning is Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Femi Falano, who joins us right here in our Labour studio. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining Good morning. us. Uh, let, let's start off with a big one, and that is this ultimatum which a lot of Nigerians saw or heard yesterday from the DSS, or is it the SSS now? They had a meeting with uh, major stakeholders in the petroleum sector, and afterwards, they issued a 48-hour ultimatum for them to make fuel available to Nigerians. I think we're in the first 24 hours now. For me, I don't think I've ever seen the DSS or the SSS make such pronouncements regarding the fuel situation. So the question is, from the law's perspective, the law that establishes the SSS, is this out of the ordinary? Is this out of place for the DSS to make such pronouncement regarding the fuel situation, which it says is now affecting internal security? The state security service does not operate under the law in Nigeria. It does its own thing. And there's nobody to call the agency to order. The business of supplying fuel to all parts of Nigeria is that of the NMPC. If the NMPC is failing to carry out its duties, the government has a duty. Right? <laughs> the government is obliged to call the officials to order. And if possible, if they're not performing, relieve them of their responsibilities. But you know, every year, once it is at the end of the year, I mean, towards Christmas, there must be artificial supply of fuel. The ultimatum will not work. Because there is no sanction for impunity in Nigeria. You think some people will take the DSS for a ride and... No, they won't. They will know that it's just, you know, but what, but what's an empty threat. What's the Because threat? nobody is going to be arrested and prosecuted to teach a lesson. The other thing... Some fuel was brought to Nigeria. Toxic fuel was brought to Nigeria. Oh! The government promised we're going to deal with them to never happen again. Was anybody arrested? Was anybody prosecuted? It's the same thing. Let's because stop. they know the people behind it. It's like oil theft. They know them. But what security threat could the DSS be referring to in this case? A security threat is economic sabotage. I mean, if people cannot get fuel, you have... Long queues in filling stations, there can, be, there, there can be serious security problems, which I won't want to mention here. You know, there can be serious security problems. So I, I can understand the worry, but what the state security service should do, not DSS. It is not a department of state security. It's not a department of the, of the presidency. It's state security service for all of us. So that body is required to submit reports to the government. Oh, this problem may lead to insecurity. What can we do very quick? Because it's a secret agency. But you're looking at the laws that so establish the So the government would then have to take a decision. How do we get the police to move to those filling stations? So you think it's the police, the role of the police? No, it's, it's, it's the internal security of our country. It's the role of the police. Okay, so let's, let's take this, the checklist. So indeed, they can actually make this pronouncement. No, there's no provision for it. But in, in, in the law that established the SSS, it says that the state security service shall be charged with responsibility for the prevention and detection within Nigeria of any crime against the internal security yes. of Nigeria. Yes. And you you've agree, agreed that indeed once, this can once, exacerbate once insecurity. Once you identify a threat to internal security, the report will be sent to the appropriate agencies of the government. And they will then tell the police, there is a problem. Because we're not under the military, we're under a civilian Isn't this a prevention mechanism? Because it says clearly the prevention 
of any crime within Nigeria. Yes, so you have to link up with other agencies that are relevant, all the security agencies. There is a threat. So they've the gone outside of their Nigeria. jurisdiction to address no, you can, marketers for, directly. No, you cannot directly. They are most, we must run this country in line with the provisions of the law. That is an act, a, a decree made by the military. But now we have the constitution, section 214, section 215, has imposed a duty on the police to maintain the internal security of our country. If the police cannot maintain adequate internal security, the president is empowered even to bring the military. So this agency is a secret agency required to submit reports. Oh, they, we, are, we fear that there will be a threat to the security of Nigeria. Mm. So, and the president will then take appropriate action. But we can't run a country where everybody does his own thing. <laughs> I, I, what, I, what I suspect, at least from this, is, I mean, in terms of prevention and detection, yes. perhaps there's a crime. As you've said, that you might not want to mention some no, of these instance, issues brother, on air. The, EFs, the, the state security goes around arresting people. Under what power? Under what power? In the, <laughs> what the law requires. It's like CIA and FBI. You have got information that somebody is threatening the security of Nigeria. Somebody is going to blow up a building. You will call the police, arrest, and take the person to court to prosecute. The, S the state security service goes around arresting people for alleged terrorist act. It's not one of the organizations listed I, I, in I, the I, Terrorism Prevention Act. I know this but, but goes how? back to, pardon me. And then you tell the SSS, they issues. say, no, yeah. the human rights people are, you know, we're going to deal with them. Right. I know this ties back to a lot of issues <gasps> with the DSS, but I know for the average Nigerian out there, seeing the end result that this might yield, which is perhaps eventual no. supply of petrol, maybe it might be acceptable to them, but you believe that even in spite of that, we the DSS is no, going it won't out work. of its it will not work. So what would you like to see happen then? Who should be taking up this case, at the least, so that we can have petrol? The president is the minister of petroleum resources. What if he uh, approved uh, And this? that's why I'm headed. Why this loud silence over the months during few scarcity? Please, you must from be. From the minister of state, from the minister, uh, minister of petroleum, himself and from the NNPC. No explanations no, that you know independent marketers or even the average we'll Nigerian can a hold on. Functional system. The government, the NNPC has come out to say, oh, uh, if we remove subsidy, uh fuel will sell for 400 naira or there about at least in the interim. So they're also preparing to increase fuel price. It's for Nigerians to get used. It's an experiment that is going on. But it's now becoming embarrassing. You know, and it could lead to security threat. That is why, you know. Is this experiment deliberate hardship? Released yes. on Nigerians? So the Nigerians are used to it. And people will say, well, even if they're going to sell it at 300 or 400 naira once it is available. That, that's the plan. You know, As a plan. In, in 2012, um, during that famous... But now, Occupy. elections are around the corner. Right. The ruling party has to pretend, you know, that we're addressing this problem. Uh, it reminds me of... I mean, lots of issues to follow, but I just wanted to... When you talked about subsidy, I, I remember that Occupy Nigeria protest, that yes. famous one, yes. uh, which you were part of addressing yes, Nigerians yes, and yes. various issues. And I recall one of those addresses, you likened the removal of subsidy to, you know, the removal of the little welfare which Nigerians now have access to. Because you said clearly, the constitution says the government is responsible for the security and welfare of its citizens. You said, well, security was out of it. But this little welfare now that people are enjoying, they now want to remove it. Are you, do you still hold that view, that removal of subsidy is still that removal of the welfare, which the little welfare which Nigerians have access to? For sure. For sure. You have just been told now that between January and June, almost now, no, now, we could not meet our open quota. So billions of dollars have been stolen by well-known oil thieves, local and international thieves, including the oil companies. The government knows them. Now, you see, there is no money. This regime went to the National Assembly this year to say, 
for subsidy in 2022, we're going to spend 443 billion naira. By July, the government rushed to the National Assembly. It is now 4 trillion. On what? And the very here, I, I said it before. The Controller General of Customs, Colonel Amid Ali, retired, came, went to the National Assembly to say that these figures are fake. The Minister of State, Petroleum Resources, Mr. Tempre um, 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 Silver. Uh, Silver, said it's a criminal enterprise. Nobody has challenged these two highly placed government officials. So, what is going on? It's no longer subsidy for the poor. It's now subsidy for smugglers and criminal elements. So to be clear, you are not against subsidy removal. You are just against the handling of subsidy. I'm totally against subsidy removal. So subsidy but there's no should, basis for it. Should not there's be no country in the world that does not subsidize the poor. The United States of America spent $2.6 trillion during the COVID-19 pandemic on cash transfer to the needy, the poor. That's the, that's the, you know, all bed of capitalism. Uh, senior advocates. There's no country If we went by what you're welfare. saying now, that means the theft is going on on two fronts. Subsidy and, of course, um, fuel importation. Fuel importation. Oh, yes. Uh, and then fuel theft. smuggling. Oil theft. Oh, yes. So if, if, the, if this oil theft, theft is... Oil theft, fuel theft. So if this theft is going on on two fronts, why do you still think the, that subsidy should remain? The duty of the government is to combat theft from the root. And we are telling the government, just like they are doing now, they've gone to hire a private organization. Can you help us? And the revelations are simply amazing. That you have some pipelines where oil has been, crude oil has been smuggled for nine years. And Shell says we are not aware. And you believe that? I, I wondered what then so your reaction the government would be. is enriching, and that is the basis of poverty in our country. Mm. Inequality. So if subsidy cannot be guaranteed not to be theft, why don't you think, why, you, why aren't you advocating for, for total removal of subsidy? No, I can never. You know why? I am saying section 14 of the constitution, it's not my own making, provides that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of the government. So the government has to take care of the welfare of the people and ensure that in providing subsidy for the needy, you do not enrich criminals as it is going on now. It's the duty of the government. <sighs> and that is why you have a government in place to deal with those who are committing crimes, economic crimes, you know, and other types of crap. And that's what is going on in our country. You know, some will so say the government maybe, wants to say, oh, uh, because uh, uh, smugglers are taking fuel out of Nigeria, therefore we are going to stop it. It's illogical. You're going to create more poverty in our country. 133 million people are said to be living below poverty level in our country. That's the official figure. By MBS. The figure is much higher. Okay. So what the government should be doing is, how do we combat poverty? Right. How do we eliminate inequality in our society? Uh, we'll, we'll get into that point, really, because it's a big one. But regarding this fuel subsidy yes. matter and all of that, yeah. some will wonder then, should the DSS also get involved? Maybe you see, the DSS let, can let, make let a you, headway. Where, but, did you, where did you get involved? Right. Mm -hmm. It's to conduct discreet information, investigation. It's not about threats and arrest those who are promoting artificial scarcity. Arrest them when, when we appreciate what they are doing is when they have been arrested and they are arraigned. But when you threat, you just issue a threat. It won't work. Well, because the people so, know that. So, they know that the government will not really so, so, so how go after you, them. How do, you how do you think or what do you recommend such that subsidy can remain but then the funds would guarantee the welfare of the people well, in terms of you the see, reduction see, of the price of right. fuel. The National Assembly, with profound respect, has failed to ask for details. They, they carry out all manners of investigations all the time on fuel supply, fuel subsidy, and the rest of them. At the end of the day, when the budget is presented, details are not given. You are simply told, 
this is a supplementary budget increasing fuel subsidy from 443 to 4 trillion. What are the details? Daily, how much fuel do we consume? The Comptroller General of Customs has said no. NMPC is lying by saying that it's 68 million. At a stage, NMPC said it was 102 million uh, liters per day. Whereas the uh, petroleum uh, DPR, Department of Petroleum Resources, said it was 32.8 million liters. So, which of these figures are we dealing with? And by the way, why should a government, if this after seven years in office, Seven years in office, be importing fuel into Nigeria. How? It was General Muhammad Buhari as a minister of petroleum resources in Nigeria. It was under his tenure that three refineries were built. And when he was coming back, I mean, when he was campaigning, he said, we build them. I'm going to build more and oh, yeah. maintain. So what has happened? It looks like this is inevitable eventually, <laughs> senior advocate, because the, the government looks like it has plans to phase out subsidy. I just wonder if you'll be protested yet again if no, it is removed you see, eventually. You see, for sure. You will be protested. For again. sure. But let me tell you this. The government has an alternative, which it was forced to act. Adopt, but has abandoned it quietly. What's that? Which is that there is an alternative to PMS, which is CNG, compressed natural gas. This government, in September 2020, the Minister of State, Petroleum Resources, announced that we have accepted CNG. I, 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 I was involved in that campaign for five years. We have accepted it. Once we are able to install machines, you know, I mean, once we are able to convert uh, PMS to CNG tanks in our vehicles, where we sell at 90 naira, you can Google. I think the, the, the challenge said, is the cost of conversion no, let me finish. of the vehicles. No, no, no. And the I, central I it, bank. It's a, it's a major no, one. No, listen. The central bank made available or announced that 250 billion naira have been earmarked for the conversion. Nobody has informed Nigerians why the conversion has not taken place. I know between a do state and Lagos, we have not less than 5,000 vehicles that have been converted. I'm converted from PMS to CNG. The personal cost or from the uh, CBN's know, provision? Yeah. You know, Is Nigeria, it personal of, cost of, or CBN provision? Of personally owned cars. No, no. No, that is being given out by the government because we are trying to look for alternatives. Also, oh, the government so, is indeed oh, following yes, through. Oh, yes, yes. But it was a policy of the government to be funded by the central bank. 250 billion naira was their mark for it. But what has happened to the money? What has happened to the project? By now, right? Because there are vehicles, you know, in different parts of the world, in Africa now, that are on CNG. In Cote d'Ivoire here, it doesn't have oil. Not less than 10,000 vehicles now are on CNG. In Nigeria, in South Africa, and many other African countries. People are moving from PMN to CNG, but we are not ready. The government simply is not prepared. No, they're not moving as fast as they no, ought to on this They're one. not moving at all uh, to you, relieve the people of their enormous burden. And speaking of the people, senior advocates, I mean, we've talked about how perhaps this petrol scarcity can exacerbate insecurity. Maybe that's why the SSS is yes. moving in. And then now the poverty situation in the country uh, and then the effect on insecurity is also a bigger one as well. Uh, the president recently talked about how you know, some states, and he has seen this, he even talked about an example, how state governors pocket funds of local governments. But before that, the Minister of State for Budget and National Planning, when responding to issues about how, how they're ending hardship, talking about the minister and himself, said that, well, looks like states are not doing their part of this deal well. So those are two major allegations against states. First, from the Minister of State, from the president. There are also questions about what happened to the derivation fund, and as you were saying, Bukola, the ecological, ecological funds as funds. well. And specifically for what the president said, do you agree with him that that still happens? State governors still pocketing 
the funds of local government. So forget the executive order 10, the NFRU guidelines and the eventual court, proce uh, court pronouncement. pronouncement on it. Is that still a thing today? With profound respect, when I listened to the president, I was telling my wife that our president is speaking like Seram or Hida or Leopard, any of the NGOs. Because this, I mean, you, you attend programs of these organizations, particularly Sarah. It is used reports to reveal enormous, you know, or monumental fraud all over the place. So when the president does that, it's worrisome because the president is empowered to stop illegal diversion of funds. So the president cannot give the impression that it's helpless. I know it, I know it, I know a governor. When 100 million naira is allocated to a local government, it takes 50 million. So what have you done about that governor? Is he above the law? But how so, can the and president this government, actually wait, just do a minute. that? This regime, the APC-led government, has majority of the state government. So it's an indictment on the APC. Of course. So what have you done as the leader of your party? Is it, is it a program of your party? What have you done to call them to... Again, this is where the state security service comes in. You say the in president every, is mean, empowered. In every local government, you have state security officials. Every local government. The ICPC, may be, um, EFCC, maybe just about 5,000 staff. Are they working, are they collaborating with the EFCC to stop the criminal diversion of local government funds. But I also believe, and this is, uh, we're having discussion at the level of the human rights community, that we are now saying it's not enough for the president to verbalize on diversion of local government funds. All of us have a duty, and you must also help. The National Assembly has said, is the only body, is the only body that discusses the budget of any, any government in Nigeria. No House of Assembly debates the budget presented by the governor. No, uh, no local government today has a budget. None. No, no, we've well, seen well, the well, House of Assembly is actually debates. When, they when you say, no, they don't debate. No, when you say them, that the, the president is empowered to stop it, is it via an executive bill? And if no. you were even to issue an executive bill, what no. will be its place no. under the there Constitution? There are agencies of the government, particularly the ICPC and the EFCC. The government ought to have made the information available to them. Please, can you act on this and stop the looting of local government funds? But the president cannot give the impression that it's separate. For the minister of national plan, again, we must not allow this blaming, you know, we must not allow the government, the federal government and the state government to engage in... Blame game? Yeah, this blame game. And I've read the positions of the federal government and the positions of the state government, and I simply laugh. Because neither side is addressing the causes of poverty in our country, which is the implementation of neoliberal policies, economic policies, retrenchment of workers, privatization or sale of public assets in the country, commercialization of services beyond the reach of the, of, of the majority of the people, importation of goods that can be produced in your country, Dollarization, dollarization of the economy. These are the causes of poverty in Nigeria. But what you are told, oh, uh, lack of access to education, uh, lack of access to health. Why, why, is there, why is there lack of access to education? So those are the indicators of maybe whether you're poor or not. Those yes. are, that's the, the multi-dimensional like nature. Yeah, of, of though they are not addressing the root cause. But before we begin to talk about, do that. about the poverty, let's look at what the law says. Some lawyers have even said that sec some sections of the Constitution only recognize 
the two tiers of government that they do not recognize the, no, threat, not true. the local government. It and true. it is on this that governors are right. No, that it, no law has guaranteed financial autonomy of uh, local governments. What's your position on Section this? Section 7 of the Constitution provides that the system of local government in Nigeria shall be by democratically elected you know, officials. That section also imposes a duty on the houses of assembly of each state to make laws to provide for the administration, the finance, and others. Section 162 of that same constitution that those lawyers conveniently ignore provides that the three tiers of government, three, federal, state, and local government council, shall be allocated many every month that shall be statutory allocations as defined by the uh, Revenue Allocation Formula you know, Act. So to say that, oh, the Constitution does not recognize the autonomy of local government is, 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 is bonkun. It's not there. It's not, it's not true. It does recognize it. What some people are advocating is that local government should be merged with state government so that we will have two tires of government. But that is what the law should be as opposed to what the law is. As of today, the Constitution recognizes three tires of government. So if the administration and finance under the Constitution has been guaranteed by the state assemblies, is that where the problem is? Because the state no. assemblies themselves are appendages no. of governors. No, the state assemblies have made laws that guarantee financial autonomy to local government. No, I've not come across any local government law that says the fund coming from Abuja meant for local government shall be matched with the fund of state government, even though the constitution prescribed that there shall be state local government fund, right? That must be a fund. In fact, section 7, subsection 5 of the constitution prescribed that state government shall give allocation, shall give money to local governments in addition to what is coming from, from the federal government. Oh, yes. It's in the constitution. You so know, the I, joint account yes. under the constitution, how can it now then be weaned off of the uh, control of state governors? Unless there is an amendment to the constitution whereby the local government will simply receive their own funds and put it into their own account. That, that's where the NFIU, the, the, the suit won by the NFIU against the governors comes in. Why isn't it having any bearing? No, what, the state, what that uh, policy which was adopted by the court was saying was that uh, the, 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 I think the NFIU tried to put some guidelines. Limit. Some guidelines. Yeah, a limit. But the, what can be claimed? What, what can be taken? Speaking of what the president can do, because this started off from the president, now you thought that maybe he could have done more. Remember the executive order 10, which was given, which was then challenged in court. I think it was in February 11 that the Supreme Court in a split decision spoke particularly to the jurisdiction of the president. So really, when you say the president could have done more or should have no, done no. more, what, what, what is, more No, what the Supreme done? Court was saying is that it's illegal to yank off monument for local, I mean, state government from Abuja, that the president does not have such a power. And what the law was saying, for us to guarantee the autonomy of local governments and the judiciary, money are marked, budgeted for them by state laws, I mean appropriation law, will be taken from Abuja, from the source. The Supreme Court said no. That does not prevent the president from asking the police, EFCC, ICPC, uh, SSS and all of them, to monitor the movement of funds, to ensure that money meant for local government, money meant for state government are Judiciously, spent. and money money for federal government mm. are judiciously spent. I mean, look at what is going on now. Uh, uh, and uh, at Abuja, with these their cash transfer policies, to whom are you sending the money? You can't sit down in Abuja and know the needy in my village. How will you know?
Oh, you're talking mm -hmm. about the NSIP, the social investment oh, program, social investment. or the CBN's transfer? All of them. I uh, know we, the we need to disagree. No, it's very serious. No, no, the CBN's policy. Yeah. I mean, that's the transfer limit. Yes. Is that one? No, 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 no. Okay, no, just no, to be clear. No, so this is about the NSIP. Yes. Okay, go ahead. You, you have empower programs. Mm -hmm. You have not just been told yesterday that about seventy thousand names, ghost, ghost names, have been smuggled in. And then the uh, trader money, market money, and the rest of them. In 2012, I got a judgment from the Federal High Court that the government of Nigeria, the Federal government, shall restore the People's Bank. You remember the People's Bank? So as to give loans to the poor. Not just, just giving out money. Loans to the poor. Poor people and disadvantaged people who cannot access loans in the bank because of the conditionalities mm. were to be assisted, you know, through the People's Bank. The Central Bank has refused, up to now, to restore the People's Bank. Because if you have the People's Bank with branches all over the country, the poor can go there. There will be records, but right now there are no records. Hmm. Uh, uh, senior of, advocate, you know, you just hear trillions have been given out, distributed to who? Uh, I'm hoping I can quickly slot this in. Some governors have come out to make, you know, to boldly say that they are not stealing local government funds and that the, the, the um, anti-corruption agencies can come after them to confirm just that. But then again, we see. That uh, there are very few no, state no, governors you see, you see, who have assented uh, to local government autonomy. No, How can you reconcile this? On, a, on, a, this on a very serious note, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we should engage in generalization. Uh, I think the last time a governor said that, you know, Governor Fayemi, who was then the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, that they were not stealing government money. A chair, if a chair person, and a chair person of a former local government. Mrs. Faji in Adekiti came out to say, you, you, Mr. Governor, you are not telling the truth. It was a time a hundred million came to my local government. We only got seven million naira. And that was the end of the, of the story. So we know these things exist. But what would be ideal? If there's a joint account, the understanding of the drafters of the Constitution is that at the end of the month, local government and state government will sit down together and fund projects that will be of benefit to local government. I mean, that, that was the understanding. But what is now being said is that the money is being diverted. Now, but for me, I think these allegations, we should stop making allegations. So the person should come out and name those states? So yes, that's number one. Okay. Yes, number two. All of us, as citizens, have a duty to demand for explanations instead of just attacking governors. Because this government, Minister, Minister of Finance and National Plan, stop the monitoring of fund released to states and local and federal government. Before, there were publications every month. Oh, we have distributed 700 billion naira. Who got what? was published. Mm -hmm. And people were using those publications to monitor and ask questions. I, I still saw that publication. No, 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 stop it. No, they only announced, oh, we have, we have distributed 700 billion naira. Yeah, they, they said the, the amount they distributed. The details are no longer stated. But for, I mean, for instance, but for Governor Wiki, who announced that we got money from Abuja. Right. You know, which has now compelled his colleagues in the oil producing states to explain what they got. Nobody knew. So there's a lot of explanations. And in the fort to be made. of Abuja, you cannot run, you cannot promote transparency and accountability okay. by operating on that. And the table. same should well, go we, for we, the ecological fund. Of course, of course. They should be published. Of course. It's always Our an interesting one with you, uh, senior The advocate. ecological fund is going to court. But we have to anchor at this point. And I like the point you made that Nigerians should actually yes. ask those questions. Yes. Instead uh, of making allegations. We, we should do this in the coming days, especially as we inch towards the coming election. But we'd like to thank you so much for your time on the Thank you very morning. much. My We've been pleasure. speaking with senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Femi Falano, on this range of other issues. And definitely uh, we'll be doing this in the coming days. Well, we'll go on a quick break now. And when we return, we have more issues for you. So you don't want to miss this.
right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, uh, we're talking politics, uh, Kwaibom politics. And as you've seen in that welcome in slide, Pastor Omoeno joins us now. He is the governorship candidate for the PDP in Kwaibom State. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning, Chamberlain. Thank you, Mopa. Thank you for having me here. It's so, good to have you here. Yeah. I think most of the engagements we've seen, is uh -huh. it's been virtual from Akwaibom oh, yeah. State. Correct. And that's why Correct. it's uh, quite interesting <laughs> having you in, in the studio. It's good to today. come on live, live TV. And, yeah. Um, so how, how is the campaign going on for you at the moment? Well, it's hectic, but it's good. It's coming up well. And, um, uh, but, you know, this election has given us space. Not like previous elections where you have back-to-back, uh, two, -back, two, two local governments in a day, but there is good spacing with this, and uh, but you do a lot of consultation in between. So it's active, but it's, it's coming up very well. It's coming up very well. I mean, we get to hear people question different things, saying, why you, why support you, and things like that. So maybe we should start by telling us. So what do you bring to the table? Um, what we bring to the table... We bring experience from the private sector. We bring organization, we bring character, we bring competence, we bring capacity, we bring compassion. Um, because no matter how much you know, if you don't have character, then there's a problem. And um, compassion also is important because you need to know the people, you need to feel for them because uh, before you want to go out to serve, then there are certain things you really think you should correct. And so compassion is a big part of it. A whole lot of people that want to serve may not have that compassion. So I bring capacity, I bring character, I bring competence, but above all, I bring compassion to the do, table. Do the people actually see that? I mean, has our politics in the country got into that stage where the electorate can actually see, okay, well, these for me are the key or vital components of the person I'm going to vote for, as opposed to probably on that day uh, or whatever affiliations, either political, historical, ethnic, whatever. So do you think we've gotten to that stage yet? We may not have gotten there fully, but we're getting there slowly. And that's why this period of campaign gives you that opportunity to talk to the people and you are able to sell yourself as it were and engage properly with them. As opposed to the past where you finish primaries and uh, the next month you're going to elections. So the electorate are not really able to bring out uh, the best that you have and analyze them properly. Uh, so I think, I think, they begin. They are beginning to see it. Analyze it as against who now? Because <laughs> it, it does look like right now the PDP in Akwaibom State is operating a monopoly of sorts. Uh, the uh, main contenders, or the would have been main contenders, the APC. It's not clear if they have a candidate for these elections. Uh, the candidate of the YPP was recently jailed by the Federal High Court. We don't know if he's appealing that. Uh, you know, over fraud charges. Uh, that's the current situation. So it's not, it's not certain if you have any contenders in the elections that you're about to face. The issue of contenders, um, for me, I'm running an election mm -hmm. and I'm running full steam. Like I'm running with contenders. I don't let that um, affect the way we, we run our campaigns. You have business with the electorate and you understand that you have to convince them that you are able to do the job. So for contenders, um, I didn't have any part to play with that. So, but for us in our campaign, we're running a full elections. I have to smile you when know. you say you don't have any part to play with that. The candidate of the YPP, for instance, used to be with the PDP. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I know that my colleague, my senior colleague, uh, Mr. Aladi Akiri Dolo Ale, in his engagement with you on Newsnight, already took you up on how you emerged and how, you know, there was, um, you know, uncertainty in the PDP if it was going to be you. You were a total surprise, uh, but you have the endorsement of the backing of the governor. Um, I think there was a lot of conversation on that. So if, I mean, the other people who could have been contenders with you in the PDP went to other platforms and then all of a sudden they find that they have 
uh, problems with the law. Uh, can you can the PDP really say, oh, they had no problems? They had no no um, hand in that. No, I, I really would like to know how the PDP had a hand in the problems they had with the law. The PDP didn't ask. Uh, any party to conduct his election or not to conduct his primaries or to conduct it at night without supervision, I don't think that had to do with the PDP. I, uh, I don't also think the PDP or anyone had a hand in uh, what happened with our brother, the senator, because these are uh, issues that predates all of us. It started in 2014, and uh, it's a federal issue. So i really like to see how the PDP had to um, be involved uh, in any of those. You know, it's unfortunate that uh, all that has happened. I wish that we all go to the field and test, you know, uh, our candidacy with the people. But talking about um, support, this has been issues we've talked over and over again. You know, when we were all aspiring, everyone wanted the endorsement of people that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's politics. You always um, want endorsements and go to the people and, you know, they now will endorse you, having checked your blueprint or manifesto as the case will be. So and then, why do you think the governor endorsed you? Well, in my in my opinion, I think he looked at he must have looked at all of us. You know our governor. You know Dom Emmanuel is a very detailed man and um, very analytical. He must have looked at it and must have seen through that this man has the capacity to run the affairs of the state. I've worked with him as um, executive director. Uh, a Greek investment. I've worked with him as a commissioner for lands and um, water resources. And um, I've also been in the state long enough. I've, I've run my business uh, the last 25 years locally, grown it locally. And so he, he must have known uh, my capacity. But again, the point I want to make very strongly yeah. this morning is that um, that you are endorsed doesn't mean that you won't go through the process. You are, you are endorsed. Every other person, somehow, were also endorsed by other groups. And to say it, all of us wanted the endorsement of the governor. Every one of us, you know. So, but that, again, did not stop the process. You are endorsed. You went through primaries. And um, I, di I didn't write the law that did not make statutory delegates not to vote. So we should be asking the people in the House of Assembly, National Assembly, how that happened. But we went through primaries as it were. So a lot of things working in your favor, more or less. God's grace. <laughs> God's grace. But if we... Now, Gosselop probably had a different style. The current governor has a different style. Now, for you, I'm just thinking for the citizens, the residents there, what will they expect? How are you... What do you plan to do? How are you going to approach this? We've seen your manifesto, which we'll come to in a moment. But in terms of what you bring to the table, uh, I'm sure you're mindful of the current governor's style as well, the project that he's worked on, because I also reckon that part of the constitution will be continuity in what he's done. How do you plan to approach the task before you? We were campaigning on a theme um, that's, you know, connecting the dots, furthering peace and prosperity in Akwaibom. That's what we're focusing on. And um, like you said, it's continuity. There are lots of things, infrastructure that have been created by this government and uh, lots of them in the health sector, the aviation sector, um, rural development, agri sector. And so our job basically is to be able to take all of this, harmonize them, and let us have, let the citizenry have the benefit of uh, democracy. For example, take, yeah. uh, we have, uh, in, when I was the executive director of um, the uh, Greek investment, we did a survey of all of the farmers in Akwaibom State. Arising from that, um, we had to set up Ibo Microfinance Bank because we wanted our farmers to have um, access to funding to be able to, you know, come into commercial agriculture. 
These are institutions that have been set up. Our job will simply be to connect them, bring the farmers to the microfinance bank and let them do what they were supposed to do so that we can get benefits. You go to the aviation industry, you've seen the investment that this government, this governor has done in the aviation industry. Our role is to connect that to ensure that we drive that through and make Aquaibon people begin to have that benefit. There is already an airline, there is a new terminal building, there is a maintenance repair and overhaul hangar in the place. We believe that when the aircraft, 10 aircraft that has been ordered by uh, Ibom Air comes in, we begin to do regional flight. With that, you need to expand and begin to think of uh, building a cargo terminal because you want, with the regional flight, and you need to improve, of course, your earnings. So you need a cargo terminal. You need to begin to seek a special status for the whole of that area to get an export free zone. So you keep adding up. There is really uh, nothing like taking back the hand of the clock. What Aquaibom has been blessed with, if you watch, is over time, every governor, like you said, that has come has a vision to keep building on what the other uh, have done. And that's what we intend to continue doing. I can go on and on and show you how we intend to yeah, connect things. You will. Things uh, we and talk about the how bit of it when we return from this break in just a moment. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. So talking about how, I know that uh, the governor did uh, disagree at some point with some of the figures about the unemployment uh, published by the MBS over time and how Aquabum didn't rank very well uh, in that department. So they talking about how you want to address that particular challenge. Human capacity is very key to all of the projects that you intend to work on, as you've seen uh, highlighted in your manifesto. So what is the thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, developing human capacity, providing jobs for the teaming youths in Aquaibom State? If you look at the Arise agenda, all of that is targeted at reducing unemployment in the state. All of the programs in the Arise Agenda, be it agricultural revolution, be it tourism, uh, be it rural development, be it infrastructural development, um, be it, of course, security, which is key, and then educational development, economic development, all of those uh, components is targeted at the youth to create to create jobs and create jobs and create jobs. Because right now, um, we may argue about the percentages, you know, but the truth also is that we have our people not, um, I may not even talk of about unemployment as underemployment because people have master's degree, people have, um, you know, maybe they studied um, something and they, what they're doing is really, not what they went for. So you need to begin to create um, jobs in the area that will take people what they studied. You have to do a lot of training and retraining of the people you have. You have to ensure that your youths not only come out with a degree, but they come out with a profession. And while in school, um, they can learn uh, some vocation that will help them to become job creators themselves. Mm. These are the areas we're targeting in all of the things we're looking at. From the Arise Agenda, which we have, we've put very clear to the people of Aquaibum State. Well, it's a good thing that we're already talking on employment uh, because the latest figures released by the National Bureau of Statistics, I do not know if you've had the time to look at some of the uh, figures released from the multidimensionally uh, poor figures or the index released recently by the MBS and some of its partners, um, unemployment in Aquaibom is put at a little over 50%. 50% is huge. Underemployment, which you also speak to, I think it's put at, uh, looking for that figure now, 16.7%. It's not as bad as the unemployment figures, but when you look at it comparatively, with a number of other states, they seem to be doing fairly on the average in terms of underemployment. But the unemployment figure is really worrisome. And you, 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 I'm sure you've also been following in recent times the back and forth between 
uh, the federal government and state governments over, you know, what the focus and the priority has been. Uh, that, you know, there has been a lot more focus on building flyovers and airports as opposed to the real things that bring development and pull people out of poverty. I'm also aware that state government, you know, just before you give me that, uh, say that the infrastructure which they put in place is important to call the investors to the states. Uh, but when you look at the figure, I mean, underlying figure for Aqua Ebo Melon, that should necessarily worry you. I know agriculture is one of the things you want to focus on, but what are you really going to do uh, to pull down that figure from 50%? It's, it's a huge one. Well, um, the, the issue of, thank you for bringing up this. There's always been this argument about how the National Bureau of Statistics got their figures. I don't know, I don't remember them talking to any, over and over again, the government of Akwaibom State have asked that the National Bureau of Statistics should tell us how they got their figures because we don't remember them talking with our uh, state um, uh, director of statistics. We don't know how they come through to that. But it's always debatable because, but the issue is, so you, is, you debate those figures? Oh, yes. For, for, for your, because we also questioned them, and they said that they had conversations, in fact, that there was a handshake between themselves and the State Bureau of Statistics. The, the, the Director General was here, mm -hmm. and he said there was a handshake mm -hmm. between themselves and the Directors of State Bureaus of Statistics, so that in case any of these contentions come up. But, I mean, without contention, what is your own st State Bureau of Statistics saying? No, we, our State Bureau of Statistics have unemployment at about 30, between 30 and 35%. That's the figure we have published. But it's still high. It's high. No, we're not contending that it's not high, you know. The reason is that, you know, and when you talk, the government, like you also mentioned, have to develop those infrastructures to be able to bring in um, investment. But when you talk about the airport, I, I, can, I can tell you that the airport itself engages people. The airline, you know um, the number of people Ibom Air has employed currently, then with other development, and even when you're developing those infrastructures, people are working there. You know, you're constructing a road, you have people that have been engaged, and they're all Aquaibomites. But that is... That's why we're saying we need to raise the bar in human capital development in the state so that we can fit. We don't have to um, um, ship out our jobs, basically. We can train our people to suit the, the sector you're talking about. This government, I know, is training a lot of pilots right now and engineers, you know. That's human capital development. They're, they're training some doctors and in their specific areas so that our young, our youths that come out of school will be able to find jobs to do. And that's why we're coming with entrepreneurship on the table. My, the key focus of all of this mm -hmm. in Aquaibom will be entrepreneurship. With all of the infrastructure that we have on ground, we need to begin to support small, medium enterprises and create entrepreneurship for our people. So that, you know, there's a limit to which government can create jobs. There's a limit. So that you don't keep, you know, just having salary bills, but yeah, you can... But are you able to say, I mean, based on what... I mean, I, this is assuming that, they, I mean, uh, you, somehow uh, you, you were part of the Aquaibom state uh, government before you Correct. decided to throw your hat into the ring. So when we ask these questions, before people think, oh, are we asking you as governor already or what? No, you still have to go through the process, but you've been a part of this government as the, the current governor, government in Aquaibom state, and now you're, you know, contending for the highest seat in the state. So... I'm just wondering, when you, when you talk about investment, the investment that the state government has made, is there a connection between how much the state government pumps into any project and how many people they intend to either lift out of poverty or at least to ensure that this number of people or this number of jobs are generated as a result of the investment that they have made? There is a connection, but you also know that it has to be in the short, long 
a short, medium, and long-term plan mm -hmm. for bringing out the people. As you develop, you, you know the number of people you need to engage, but overall, in the final analysis, by the time you run through the meal, of course, the people will be, the more people will be engaged as you get through the full value chain of what you're doing. So you don't also, don't forget these are investments. You don't overbloat that investment. You don't bog it down with um, overhead costs, salaries, and all of that. But there is a plan in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term, the number of people you bring out of employment. But like I keep saying, agriculture itself doesn't, everyone can get involved in it. And you can ensure that somehow a whole lot of our people begin to do and see agriculture as a business. Mm -hmm. And once government supports that, then people get engaged. For example, the oil palm industry. You, if government decides to say, okay, Aquaibom is all of the place in Aquaibom, you have um, oil palm. And so you want to make that, um, develop that to a full value chain. Everyone can now have to plant, you know, uh, oil palm trees, and it gives you maybe in 18, in 18 months, maximum 24 months, the new seedlings that we have, and then you harvest. The people can sell to government. There is a meal that meals this. So you bring Aquaibum back. It used to be mm -hmm. in the days, um, back in the days, an oil palm um, uh, zone. And so you bring that back. Everybody is involved. Well, so, you give him an instance there. Um, and I'm sure that while you're doing that, you also must be looking at education. I know you've also spoken to education, training, developing capacity, and making sure that the the people of Aquaibom State have the right st set of skills needed uh, to develop the state. Uh, but looking more at the basic level, only recently we're told that Nigeria has over 20 million children out of school. Uh, some people, again, have debated the figures because just two years ago or four years ago, we were at 10 million, according to UNICEF. UNESCO, however, says we have 20 million out of school children. Now, oftentimes when that happens, people look to the north of the country, uh, you know, and uh, for a number of reasons. But in recent times, there have been other researches done, and they've also found out that Aquaibom State in the south has a significant number of children who are not in schools. I do not know if you've seen this report, um, and I do not know if it's something that, assuming you have, you know, if it's of concern to you and what it is that you, do, you intend to do to address it. You know, Aquaibom is one of the states in this country that runs free um, education, you know, up to secondary school level. And um, every year, the state government pays close to a billion for uh, the students to write work, and it's free. So the issue of out-of-school children must be taken in proper context, you know. But again, there's been a lot of... Um, uh, changes in in our educational system, and we need we intend to build more on that. We intend to come up with a um, lot of things that will make school attractive to students and to pupils and to parents to release their children. Is it a problem you are aware of in Aquaibom State that the children are not really interested in school? I wouldn't say they are not interested. They are interested, but if sometimes you also know that children can be easily distracted. So we need our parents to ensure that part, they partner with government mm -hmm. to not to leave everything to government. You know, because education is free, the parents must get involved. Did my child go to school? What did my child do in school? I still remember my mother used to, when I come back, she takes me through my assignment, look at my homework, teach me how, you know, um, um, vocabularies and pronunciation. How many parents today are really doing that? You know, so we need to go back to the basic where we have our parents get involved in looking at what our children will do in school. And when they come, I remember my, my mother will search my school bag before going to school in the morning. There are things, if you have anything in that bag that you were not given from home, you have explanations to do. So much as we put the blame, um, the out of school children, we also must be able to look at it, you know, holistically. I believe that government is doing its part. 
parents, all of us, must be interested in what our words are doing. I spoke to a number of youths in New York uh, after we had an interview with the governor, and some of them were quite particular about science and technology, ICT. I mean, they talked about a certain industrial park that used to be before and how they just can't wait to get it back because for them, that is the oil, as it were. And you have yes. teeming dudes in the state. So what will be your plan? How do you want to approach that particular area? If you look at that blueprint very well, you'll find out that um, ICT is key. There is a science park, and I've consistently said we will resuscitate the science park. This government actually had gone into a contract with a Chinese firm, but that was pro-COVID. Since then, COVID, the people left and they've not been able to come back. So the science park is on the front burner. We know that the whole world today runs on technology. And um, so we need to put our youths and begin to create a platform, an environment for them to operate. And our schools, We'll now we're thinking of building new schools that will have digital platforms. So the kids from their young age will be attracted. So, but, but what is the vision that you have for techno ICT in the state? Any targets that you want to achieve? No, we believe that we should, with the creation of the Science Park mm -hmm. and working, um, Google is now one of the triangles. Google is coming in and is coming in through. Um, uh, Aquaibom, I think it's Aquaibom, Lagos, and Abuja. And then once that starts, of course, you'll be able, we're looking at close, you know, on a yearly basis, we should be able to get our youth close to 500,000 and lift them out and let, you know, and then you begin to make everything technologically based. As you do that, you're encouraging people, even from your civil service, you're encouraging people, you know, to become uh, computer savvy, and that's 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 the way we're looking. All right, let's our colleagues in Lagos have got some questions for you. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, I mean, I was reading the NGF's response to the federal government, or at least to the Minister of State, on that you know debate on who is responsible for poverty and unemployment. And you know, one of the statements that was quoted is a Kwaibom State Government's statement saying that, well. Uh, Economic policies generally are set by the central uh, government nationally, essentially saying that it is actually the federal government that is mainly responsible for this. This is sets the tone, even though we know that state governors also have their economic policy as well. So, uh, I mean, that's one question on the one hand. But I, I like for you to speak to this, really, because for a lot of people, they don't know what is what. They just know they stay in a particular area and they expect that the roads are fixed. They expect that there's portable water. They expect that there's access to health care, education, and all of that infrastructure. Uh, what for you will be key, maybe, if you have identified the major challenge uh, between the working together of the federal, state, and even local government such that the people can enjoy life regardless of who is responsible? Have you been able to identify maybe that issue with collaboration between governments and how you would sort that out? Thank you so much. Um, the, the, the collaboration between the state and federal government shouldn't really be a burden on the citizenry because like you rightly pointed out, what they want is service. I know that um, we in Akwaibo, when I was commissioner for lands and water resources, we had a very good collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Water Resources. We worked with them to provide uh, services to our people and I looked at our laws again. From that collaboration, we're able to come out with uh, a water bill that has been passed by the House of Assembly. We're able to uh, do uh, some um, cleanup uh, in the rural areas. And we had the Federal Ministry of Water Resources combining with the state government to ensure that our people are trained on Clean up with the Clean Up Nigerian group. And um, I know recently, even after I've left office, two weeks ago, I was nominated and given an award for that collaboration. So there is, once 
you, I know our state government collaborates and will still continue to do that because you want to get service to your people. We've had occasion where the state government have gone on to do federal roads because um, Akwaibomites are the one driving on, on the road. So we believe that we'll continue with that collaboration to bring um, tangible dividend to the citizenry of Akwaibom. Sometimes I do not personally believe that we should um, come throw blames at each, we should go back office and try to sort out what the issues are so that our people ultimately will benefit from the services that they should get because um, if a man is hungry, he wants to eat food and he, sometimes he may not care whether it's federal government providing the food or state government is providing the food. That's, that's my take on that and we'll continue to collaborate with the federal government. Yes, uh, Pastor, no, I'm also concerned about the unemployment figures. And I'd like to tie it to, you know, the industrialization strides of the current administration. During our last interview with the governor, he spoke a lot, you know, uh, in glowing terms of the efforts in that direction, the syringe factory, the coconut oil virgin factory, uh, the metering company. Uh, you know, these are structures for prosperity and prosperity cannot be hidden. So if these uh, industries are up and running, why haven't they led to a significant, you know, uh, change in the unemployment figures in Akwaibom State? You, you remember that uh, Governor Dom Emanuel came in and made the state as a purely civil service state. And in eight years, you, like you've mentioned, the number of industries has been able to attract. It can only get better. It can only get better. The syringe factory, the, mit the metering factory. Right now, um, uh, there is uh, a petrochemical plant that is uh, coming up in the state. All of that will be one step at a time. You can't, it's not, it's not like a magic wand. You will, it's putting so much in terms of investment and energy to get acquired on people to begin, I mean, out of, out of this unemployment. But the most important thing is, no matter how much um, we bring in, I believe that we need to encourage much more of entrepreneurship in the state. I believe that Aquaibomites um, should be supported uh, in their businesses. Small, medium enterprises okay. must thrive. 90, almost 90% 90 of uh, the about between 60 to 70 percent of the economy uh, of any country is managed by, uh, handled by the small medium enterprises. That's how you lift people out of poverty. That's how you create a middle so, class. Yeah. And I'm sure we can, we can do that. Yeah. So as you wind down now, what is happening and what will you do about the boom deep sea port and the boom industrial city? Boom, deep sea port is on course and um, we will pursue that and ensure that we begin, uh, we get that realized. In, as we get into office, we'll continue with the work that the state government have done. I'm sure all of the uh, reports have come in and uh, then Ibom Industrial City will be on course. What we need to do is to ensure that we create uh, that industrial city in such a way that my, my thinking is give incentives for people to come. You, we, you'll be part of it. You'll get a land. We'll give you some incentive. Um, maybe give you the land. We can just as per discussion, give you the land free, but have parameters to work with you because a lot of things, again, I discovered as commissioner for land, a lot of people had land and they just take the papers, uh, use the collateral, take money for something else. So the new approach is we we give you the land and we have a time frame. We work with you on timelines that will, but we are prepared to give you a lot more incentive. That's how to grow the industrial city and then ensure that we are able to monitor those timelines. All right, Judy, thank you very much indeed for coming on. Now, Pastor Omoeno, governorship candidate of the PDP in Akwaibom. Say thank you and all the best. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. All right, just a minute. We've got some uh, quick messages to take a look at. Uh, Dr. Awodi is talking about oil theft. He says the quagmire bedeviling the oil sector in Nigeria shows that oil theft and a few subsidies are mutually reinforcing.
there is clearly a systemic top to bottom rot in the sector. If 133 million Nigerians are currently poor, then imagine the millions, millions more that will be plunged into poverty when the only subsidy they enjoy is removed. A genuine subsidy reform and curtailing oil theft is elementary political economy, he says. Well, this one is from uh, David Algrain and talking about food sufficiency, he says government agencies should stop promoting the export of the little food we produce, <laughs> which is not even enough to feed Nigerians, and rather be encouraging and subsidizing the importation of machines to process same for local consumption and export. This will create employment and boost production. Well, this one is from Nicholas Osita, and he's talking about DSS and fuel distribution. He says, while it is understandable the concerns of the DSS on what artificial scarcity of fuel pertains to national security, I am of the opinion that the DSS will never be able to enforce the distribution of fuel in Nigeria. I mean... How many operatives will the agency deploy to, say, Lagos State, for instance, to monitor this strange order? The bottom line is to find the root causes of these frequent disruptions in the distribution chains. <laughs> well, well, well. I said it's strange, right? Okay. Strange order. <laughs> well, a word is not for the wise, <laughs> I just add. Well, that is the show today. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain so Goodbye. Well, God bless your weekend. Do enjoy your Friday. Thank you so much for staying with us throughout this week. I'm Mao Kwehokun Yusuf. I'm Kairoki Kyulu. Yes, make the weekend count. Thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. <laughs>